Welcome to the Alger Podcast. Following the podcast, there will be a brief disclosure. Hello, I'm Alex Bernstein, and you're listening to the Alger Podcast, investing in growth and change. In 2023, GLP-1 made overnight headlines as one of the most innovative crossover weight loss drugs to hit the healthcare industry in years. But some investors may be surprised to learn that GLP-1 has been under observation in this manner for quite a long time. Here to take a deep dive with me on the subject of GLP-1 are Alger Senior Healthcare Analyst Kai Chow and Associate Analyst Ying Lu Zhang. Kai, Ying Lu, thanks so much for joining me this afternoon. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for having us. Before we get into the subject of GLP-1, we've just come off a bit of a difficult year for healthcare stocks in general. Can you give an overview of where we are investment-wise in the healthcare industry? I think 2023 has been a tough year relative to the rest of the market for healthcare. There's a number of reasons for that. You know, we're in an election year and typically it's just kind of conventional wisdom that people get nervous about healthcare and reduce their healthcare exposure going into an election year. Because election year is when politicians, when they run for office, will talk about all the bad things they're going to do to the healthcare uh, players, particularly in pharma. So there's that. And then there has been regulatory uncertainty in terms of new regulations that have been passed that have negatively impacted different players in the healthcare industry. For example, Medicare Advantage got a rate cut that will last three years. Also, there was a lot of healthcare spending in 2020, 2021, and we're still kind of digesting and coming off of that overhang of ex excess abnormal spending that was related to investing in discovering therapies for treating COVID. And so all those factors have come in to make this a tough year for the healthcare market. Yet you remain pretty excited for the coming year. It's an exciting year, particularly in the area of life science innovation. You know, Alger as a growth and innovation oriented investment firm, we're very oriented towards innovation, not only in terms of science and technology, but also in commercialization and how patients are treated. And so we're focused on that. We continue to see innovation in medical technologies in terms of where previously acute surgeries are taking place. We were seeing an ongoing shift to outpatient settings. We're seeing an ongoing shift in having treatments and technologies that enable patients to not have to stay in the hospital. We're seeing more technologies that allow patients to stay at home more and be well taken care of at home. So I think when we talk about innovation, people always think, oh, a great new robot or oh, a, a new discovery in gene or cell therapy. And those are all true, but there's really simple innovations as well. Well, I know everyone wants to hear about your thoughts on GLP-1, how we got here, where we're going. Ying Lu, were you surprised to see GLP-1 suddenly take center stage this past year? Well, I'm surprised, but also not surprised because the GLP-1 drug has actually been around for more than two decades. So it started as one class for the diabetes patients. The first GLP-1 drug, Exanatide, developed by Lilly, was approved in 2004 for glycemic control in type 2 diabetes patients. And after that, Multiple pharmas, including Lilly, Eli Lilly, and Novo, started improving on the class for a better efficacy in glycemic control. And it was discovered that actually these drugs deliver meaningful weight loss benefits in diabetes patients. So that's when pharma started testing these drugs in obesity patients who need to lose weight but don't have diabetes. And it turns out that GLP-1 drugs work very well in these patients and patients could lose up to 20% of their body weight. Yeah, so, so I think a lot of the excitement has been the media, the investors, and just the consumer, the general public getting really excited that, hey, you know, this obesity, which we all in some way know is negative for health. Uh, we don't know the causality a lot of the times, but we know it's very linked to different health conditions. Obesity impacts people's identity, it impacts their self-image. So people are really excited about the opportunity that, hey, there might be some wonder drug that's gonna help everybody lose weight, be healthier, and feel better about themselves. And then I think in some of the early trials around obesity, you know, people are showing that they can lose you know, up to 20% of their weight as long as they stay on the drug, it stays off. And so that's all really promising. And if we just do the math on the United States having 40% of its population who are technically obese and over 10% who are severely obese, 
there's all this excitement that, wow, we could apply these therapies, these ELP1s to tens of millions of people. So I think that's where all the root excitement comes from. Ying Lu, you mentioned a moment ago that GLP-1 has actually been around for two decades, which I think might surprise a lot of people. Can you talk a bit about how it started and even what it actually is? Because I'm not sure how many people really know. So as I mentioned, it started as a diabetes drug and GLP-1 works through multiple organs in our body. So for glycemic control in diabetes, it pushes the pancreas to produce more insulin. And it also acts on the brain to suppress your appetite and also on the stomach to slow your gastric emptying. So patients will feel less hungry and reduce their food intake and therefore lose weight. But other than weight loss, we're also seeing benefits in comorbidities of obesity. So we're seeing reduced risk of cardiovascular risk. We're seeing improvement in renal function and liver disease. And we're also seeing benefits in indications that are strongly associated with obesity, such as sleep apnea. Do you think we ever get to a point where it's specifically being branded and marketed as a weight loss drug? Yeah, so for Novo semaglutide, it was already approved as weight loss management for obesity patients. And for Eli Lilly, their terzepatide was also recently approved in obesity patients, and they have just started selling them as a weight loss drug for obesity patients. Yeah, and they actually have different names. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so they have different brand names for different indications. It's the same drug, but, but they, they decided to call them different names. Interesting. Can you talk about some of the current perceived barriers these drugs may be facing as they further enter the market? Well, maybe Ying Lu should start with the issue that everybody seems to not pay enough attention to, which is persistence. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And that's related partly yeah. to the side effects as well, which is mostly nausea and vomiting. An important factor that we think many potentially overlook, but we take into consideration is persistence, meaning how long do patients stay on a drug before they decide to stop? Now, based on data from earlier generations of GLP-1s, we know that 50% of diabetes patients will stop after one year, either due to side effects, like I mentioned, or because of inconvenience of administration because it's a weekly injection. Now, we're hearing from Lily that their latest generation of GLP-1 Mongero is seeing improved persistence over the earlier generations. But we still think it's inevitable to see some patients stop the drug after some time, either because they can't tolerate the side effects anymore or they have reached their ideal weight. So it's a factor that we still can't overlook and it will be important to think about when thinking about the market opportunity of GLP-1s. Yeah, another thing that people are aware of, but perhaps don't pay enough attention to is that the coverage, meaning like who's going to pay for all this. But today, I think the coverage for obesity use by payers is actually flat or actually contracting. And a lot of the use for obesity is actually out of pocket pay today. Just recently, because there's been such a surge of excitement and usage, a lot of self-insured employers have started cutting back on their coverage or trying to limit the coverage so that you know, these are expensive drugs that people are not just trying it out and effectively kind of wasting money. This somewhat ties to the persistence issue as well, right? You don't want people incurring tens of thousands of dollars and kind of getting no enduring benefit out of it. Do you see the price eventually coming down? Yeah, we absolutely do. We think the vendors probably expect price to come down. And it's actually the key debate when it comes to the healthcare system wanting to and being able to give access for the obesity indication. I think definitely will come down. And another important driver for prices coming down will be, I think in 2026, 2027, we should start getting oral versions yeah, we are seeing multiple companies developing oral GLB ones, including Lilly and some other companies. And we think it will become an important segment of the market and taking market shares from injectables. You've mentioned a couple of companies. Who do you like in this space and why? Yeah, so there are multiple companies we like in this space. Amgen is developing a long-acting GLP-1 drug that can enable monthly or even quarterly dosing which will be much more convenient for patients. We think patients will definitely prefer less frequency dosing than the weekly injection, which is what they're getting right now. 
With so many players not getting into this space, has it been challenging to determine who the possible long-term leaders are? Yeah, I think there are you know many working on the space, but we tend to follow the science and pick out the ones we think have the best science with the highest probability of success and who are in the lead. So Scholar Rock is one we like that they are combining myostatin inhibitor with potentially GLP ones for improved quality of weight loss. And Zilin Pharma is another name we like. They are not only targeting GLP-1s, they're looking at GLP-2s and also glucagon receptors going to the novel science for better quality of weight loss. Kai Yinglu, what's the one message you think investors should take away from this conversation? Well, I think that a lot of exciting innovation, important innovation is still happening. And that's a lot of what our investment focus on is here at Alger and particularly in our life science strategies. But it really permeates the entire firm is that we're looking for important innovations that will change the lives of patients. And we're looking to benefit our shareholders through those discoveries. Yeah, I was going to add that I agree with Kai that there's a lot of exciting innovation right now in the space that could not only improve patients' lives, but drive significant growth for a company value. And the sector has underperformed, but now sentiment could be turning. So we think it's a great time to be looking at healthcare investing. Kai, Yinglu, thanks so much for joining me this afternoon. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Great talking to you. And thank you for listening. For more information on investing in health sciences and for more of our latest insights, please visit alger.com. The views expressed are the views of Fred Alger Management LLC, FM, and its affiliates as of January 2024. These views are so to exchange at any time may not represent the views of all portfolio management teams. These views should not be interpreted as a guarantee of the future performance of the markets, any security, or any funds managed by FAM. These views are not meant to provide investment advice and should not be considered a recommendation to purchase or sell securities. Holdings and sector allocations are subject to change. Risk disclosures. Investing in the stock market involves risks, including the potential loss of principal. Growth stocks tend to be more volatile than other stocks as their prices tend to be higher in relation to their company's earnings and may be more sensitive to market political and economic developments. Local, regional, or global events such as war, acts of terrorism, and spread of infectious illness such as COVID-19 or other public health issues, recessions, or other events could have a significant impact on investments. A significant portion of assets will be invested in healthcare companies, which may be significantly affected by competition, innovation, regulation, and product obsolescence, and may be more volatile than the securities of other companies. Investing in innovation is not without risk, and there is no guarantee that investments in research and development will result in a company gaining market share or achieving enhanced revenue. Companies exploring new technologies may face regulatory, political, or legal challenges that may adversely impact their competitive positioning and financial prospects. Also, developing technologies to displace older technologies or create new markets may not in fact do so, and there may be sector-specific risks as well. As is the case with any industry, there will be winners and losers that emerge, and investors therefore need to conduct a significant amount of due diligence on individual companies to assess their risks and opportunities. Past performance is not indicative of future performance. The following positions represent the noted percentages of Alger's firm-wide assets as of October 31, 2023. Amgen Inc., 0.69%. Eli Lilly & Co., 0.92%. Novo Nordisk, 0.03%. Scholar Rock Holding Group, 0%. Zeeland Pharmaceutical, 0%. Important information for U.S. investors. This material must be accompanied by the most recent fund fact sheets if used in connection with the sale of mutual fund and ETF shares. Fred Alger & Company LLC serves as distributor of the Alger Mutual Funds. Important information for UK and EU investors. This material is directed at investment professionals and qualified investors as defined by MIFID FCA regulations. It is for information purposes only and has been prepared and is made available for the benefit of investors. This material does not constitute an offer or solicitation to any person in any jurisdiction in which it is not authorized or permitted, or to anyone who would be an unlawful recipient, and is only intended for use by original recipients and addressees. The original recipient is solely responsible for any actions in further distributing this material and should be satisfied in doing so that there is no breach of local legislation or regulation. Certain products may be subject to restrictions with regard to certain persons or in certain countries 
under national regulations applicable to such persons or countries. Alger Management Limited, Company House Number 8634056, domiciled at 85 Gresham Street, Suite 308, London, EC2V7NQ, UK, is authorized and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority for the distribution of regulated financial products and services. FAM and or Weatherby Capital LLC, U.S. Registered Investment Advisors Service Subportfolio Managers to Financial Products, distributed by Alger Management Limited, Alger Group Holdings LLC, parent company of FAM, and Alger Management Limited, FAM, and Fred Alger and Company LLC are not an authorized person for the purposes of the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000 of the United Kingdom, FSMA. And this material has not been approved by an authorized person for the purposes of Section 21.2b of the FSMA. Important information for investors in Israel. This material is provided in Israel only to investors of the type listed in the first schedule of the Securities Law, 1968, the Securities Law, and the Regulation of Investment Advice, Investment Marketing, and Investment Portfolio Management Law, 1995. The fund units will not be sold to investors who are not of the type listed in the first schedule of the Securities Law. Fred Alger and Company, LLC, 100 Pearl Street, New York, New York, 10004, 800-223-3810, Alger.com.